The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. You may be surprised to hear that Indigenous issues rate fairly high up the list of concerns by the average Canadian voter. And so tonight, we'll talk to three of a record number of Indigenous candidates running for Parliament about why they're in the race. Then, we'll consider more broadly what this campaign has revealed about reconciliation and what some Indigenous people say is needed. It's Wednesday, September 15th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. Seventy-seven candidates in this federal election identify as either First Nation, Inuit, or Métis. That's a record. Let's find out what prompted three of them to answer their party's call. And, as is our custom, we'll introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Kempville, Ontario, with Lorraine Reckmans. She is running for the Green Party in Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands, and Rideau Lakes. And it's her sixth time on the ballot. In London, Ontario, Jason Henry, who's running for the NDP in Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. He is chief of the Chippewas of Kettle and Stony Point First Nation, although he has taken a leave from those duties during this campaign. And in Orillia, Ontario, Cynthia Wesley Eskimo. She is a Liberal Party candidate in Simcoe North. She's also the chair for Truth and Reconciliation at Lakehead University. And as I welcome you three to the program tonight, let me also add that we did reach out to the Conservative Party of Canada for one of their candidates. Uh, they didn't get back to us. That is, if I may say, standard procedure for the Conservative Party. They don't respond to media inquiries, and that's their right not to do so, but that's why we don't have a Tory on the show tonight. All right, Lorraine, let's start with you, because this is your sixth time running. How come you keep doing it? Well, I think what drives me really is, is climate change and the fact that we have to take action on climate change. But what, what engaged me was actually the fact that Indigenous people were being excluded from resource development decisions that impacted traditional lands. Do you feel you are able to have an impact by running but not winning? I do. I do think I'm having an impact. I mean, as you know, as the years go by, we see um, Canadians generally wanting to discuss Indigenous rights issues at the doorstep. I find that an interesting answer because uh, we do have to remember that probably upwards of 80 percent of the people who will run in this federal election won't win. But they're running anyway because they think they've got something to say. So, OK, hats off to you for doing so. Jason, how about to you? You are... Um, Apparently, I'm told you weren't going to run, and then something happened that changed your mind. What happened that changed your mind? Well, I've been considering running for a number of years because I have the ability and the voice to be able to create positive change for Indigenous people. On July 1st, I was making my way to London, Ontario for the Turtle Island Healing Walk. Um, and I began seeing signs uh, in the country that said, hate has no home here and our London family. And I began to get worried that I would attend this event like I've attended many others, and I'd see the same 100 faces at the event. And I arrived at Victoria Park, and there was a crowd of people wearing orange shirts, and I felt good. It was more than 100 people. And I socialized with people that were close to me, um, you know, in my family. And eventually, it was time to give my opening remarks, and I was called to the stage, and I passed a reporter. And he said to me, we have more people here than BLM and our London family. That means we have more than probably 10,000 people. And that sounded like amazing. I got on the stage, all I could see was this huge sea of orange. And then we walked down Richmond Row and we got to the corner of Richmond and Oxford. And uh, a very good friend of mine, Raymond Deleary, said to me, hey bro, look back. Take a picture of that sea of orange Send it to Jugmeet Singh and tell him you're in because that is evidence that people are ready to change and they're supporting us. And do you feel vindicated in your decision? You think it was still the right thing to do? I absolutely do. I've had great, great responses. Last night I was at an engagement and following the engagement, um, one of the organizers let me know that sometime during the night somebody said, I'm not going to vote for the drunken Indian guy. And that tells me that I've made the right choice because I, I'm not a drunken Indian guy. I, I'm an Indigenous leader. 
I am a father, I am a husband, I am a son, and I am going to promote change and create change in this country. And those old racial slurs, those antiquated thoughts about Indigenous people will be eradicated in this country. Whether I'm elected or not, I will promote change and create change. Cynthia, this is not your first run either. How many times is this for you, putting your name on a ballot? This is the third time, but uh, I've been at this game. I mean, I've been trying to change the face of Indigenous Canada for the last 40 years. And frankly, uh, as both of the candidates have already said, it's working. People are very interested in actually what's going on. The unmarked graves raised a huge amount of, of compassion and sympathy across uh, across Canada for what has happened. It, it made it evidence-based, I suppose. But I've been uh, very interested in actually taking our voices to the table. I think that, uh, as, as somebody already mentioned, uh, we have not necessarily been included in conversations around environment and we need to be and i think we need to be included in conversations around what kinds of things the liberal party has put forward on their platform from indigenous people it's not enough to say we're going to do this we need to be there to ensure that it gets done so there's a lot of reasons why i think uh, I, i'm running and, and of course the, the liberal party itself it, it aligns with my values i mean I, I respect the green party and i respect the ndp as well for what they have to say um Conservative Party, not so much, but but I'm running because I think it's an important thing for us to do, and uh, and and also Indigenous women need to be standing at that table and, and ensuring that, that that their voices are heard as well. Now, for whatever reason, you have decided, I think, all three times to run as a Liberal in some of the safest Conservative ridings in this country. How come? <laughs> Well, I happen to be living in those safe those safe ridings, and in this riding in particular, in Simcoe North, we have two very big and, and progressive First Nation communities. The Beausoleil First Nation in you know, close to Midland, and of course here close to Aurelia is the Rama First Nation. And both of those communities are absolutely moving forward. We're not waiting for the government to save us. I mean, that's a long wait, as we all know in it by now. But they're actually moving forward very, very aggressively and very confidently into the future. And I'm going to help them. I'm going to ensure that they get there. But the rest of the riding is also having issues around housing, affordability, and accessibility. But I'm learning very clearly that we have people in these ridings that are doing an incredible work, not only about sustainability, but regenerative work. And I think that's where we all need to go. It's important. I do want to ask all three of you about something that is, that is a little delicate, and that is you know that there are Indigenous people in this country who think it is wrong for Indigenous people to run in so-called colonial settler parliamentary elections, that in some respects you are participating in a political process that has oppressed indigenous people in this country for hundreds of years. So I wanna ask Lorraine whether you've run into any uh, brushback or pushback uh, during the times that you have run because of your willingness to participate in this parliamentary process. Well, Steve, I have to tell you that just this past week, I received a letter from uh, National Chief uh, Roseanne Archibald, and I was really pleased to see it. You know, it was a, a real shot in the arm to me as an Indigenous woman candidate, uh, with an understanding that we have to. We, are, we have to inform public policy in this country. If our voices aren't there, uh, they're not going, our issues are not going to be addressed. And so there's a lot of well-meaning, um, you know, remarks, well-meaning statements that people have made about Indigenous issues, but I think they're missing the mark on, on what, you know, what are the foundational things that we have to deal with. Uh, so it, it's necessary that we're there. If we're, if we're not there, I mean, policy will be made about us, without us. And we support, and Greens support free prior informed consent. It's a principle, you know, to engage and to base relationships on. I mean, the, you know, the thing that's troubled me is uh, going back to um, my experience in the National Aboriginal Forestry Association, advocating for Indigenous rights in forest policy, it became evident to me that the decisions weren't made based on questions of sustainability or fairness or equity. That the questions were and the answers were being based on political um, political positions on issues. So it was evident to me that in order to affect change, we had to get political. Jason Henry, how about to you? Any awkwardness about participating in a uh, colonial settler parliamentary process? I'm already a you know, uh, federally elected official. I'm an Indian Act chief. I, I ran in a federal election. Um, I was elected as a member of council and a chief. I've already entered the system. And as an Indigenous person, I, I have a federally 
issued card that tells me what rights I have supposedly. I and without without changing that because currently we are within that system. There's no true nation to nation relationship right now. And having many critics myself being elected official, I I know that being a critic on the outside, you know, throwing stones, so to speak, in doesn't do any good. We have to actually, you know, engage in the system and affect change. Mm. I I have a very solid base in my culture, my identity, my spirituality. I'm a member of the Loon Clan from the Anishinaabe Nation. And I know that through that, it that gives me the ability and the responsibility to do this work. And some of us have to do that. We don't have the option to sit back because if we don't embrace the changes now, we're leaving that for our children to suffer the same way we did. Cynthia, any brushback that you've received along the way for running? Oh yeah, I, I yes, I have had many conversations over the course of time. Um, I got I'm too busy for that. I've got lots of things that I have to do. I do a lot of public education. I'm trying to get people to understand across Canada that we have things that need to be done and that we can do. We can collaborate on these things. We can get this stuff done if we're working together. Uh, running for the Liberal Party, that's. I don't see that as a, as, a, as a wrong thing to do. We live in Canada. We have to re have a relationship with the federal government and the provincial government and the First Nation governments and every everybody else. And I'm all for working together. I mean, the Maori have had uh, seats at the, in the in the New Zealand government since the 1800s. You know, I think we're running a little bit behind when it comes to that because we could certainly put some designated seats there. And I think it would actually start to m more modernize and, and, and normalize the process. But I think we have to have our voices there. We stood back for far too long. And in 2015, we convinced a lot of Indigenous people that they needed to vote, and they did. So I still remember little old ladies lining up to be able to get in the door to make sure they cast their vote. So I think we've changed the picture of who should participate and who should not. And I believe that uh, if we want to have our voices heard, we better stand up and make sure that we speak loud enough for them to be heard by everybody across the country. Now, that's an interesting idea, and I haven't seen it in any of the major party platforms, the notion, Jason, of having designated seats in the Parliament of Canada for Indigenous representation. What do you think of that idea? I've thought of it for a long time, and it's interesting because will that affect the change? Will that be the answer? I mean, it's important. It's important for us to have that voice and have it continually entrenched in Canada. But also, is that is that the right thing to do? Because what I've considered, actually, is having an Indigenous riding, right? Rather than having our, po our population split up by the area we live in geographically, but actually having an, an Indigenous set aside seats based on Indigenous people across Canada. We have to have the election still, but it'd be say like the six or eight First Nations in, in my area or the six or eight First Nations in Northern Ontario and, and break it up that way. I think it's a very good idea. And I think it's very important. Okay, mm -hmm. let's look at th that. Those that idea may not be in the platforms, but we do have some ideas here that are in the platforms. And I'm going to take a moment just to go through some of the bullet points here. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but it's a few of the ideas. Uh, a look at a few pieces of reconciliation in the major party platforms. The Conservative Party, for example, uh, would purport to spend $5 billion to invest in resource development as a means of enhancing reconciliation. Uh, the Liberal Party would commit an additional $1.4 billion for a mental health and wellness strategy and invest a further $2 billion in Indigenous housing. Uh, the New Democrats would like to implement a co-developed, fully funded Indigenous national housing strategy and by the way, we should mention the NDP is the only party to use the word genocide in its platform. And the Green Party would end all the drinking water and boil water advisories, of which there are still 52 in effect in 33 communities. And as another aside, the Greens and the NDP promise to respect Indigenous sovereignty, but unlike the Liberal and Tory documents, there's no mention of Indigenous sovereignty there. So, uh, let's go through this. Lorraine, why do you think the Greens have the best platform on offer? Well, I, I would like to say that their policy is informed. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the policy motions that were developed for the Green Party of Canada are based in the Royal Commission on Aboriginal uh, People recommendations from 1996 that talk about foundational change, things like repudiating the doctrine of discovery, uh, things like uh, repealing the Indian Act, rebuilding 
uh, in making the investment to rebuild in nations. And that goes back to the question you asked earlier about making seats available inside Parliament for Indigenous people. I mean, the question is, uh, when are we going to get to the, you know, the foundational work of reconstituting nations so that they can negotiate on an equitable, uh, from an equitable position? Uh, so we add to RCAP recommendations, which RCAP gave us a 20-year plan forward in 1996 uh, to reconcile with Canada. It talked about a new royal proclamation, uh, talked about a new relationship, recognizing the nationhood status of Indigenous peoples. And then we bring in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So the green platform is based, uh, the policy is based on a lot of work that Canada has already done to move us forward. And I think the Greens are more bold and progressive in, in saying things like it's time to work, you know, on a basis of free prior and informed consent with First Nations um, to repeal the Indian Act and, and get out from under that oppressive, sexist, racist policy. Cynthia, let me get you to speak to one of the criticisms we hear about both the leader of your party and about the party itself, and that is lots of talk, not necessarily lots of action. You want to speak to that? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's not something that I would absolutely not agree with. I think that the, the Liberal Party and, and Justin Trudeau has made some huge strides forward. This is a government that has said yes. This is the first government that, in my recollection, and I'm well over 60 now, that has said yes, that has taken a whole of government approach, that has put in every single mandate letter of every single ministry that they must deal with these issues. They're about 86 uh, percent addressing the uh, 94 calls to action. Uh, they're either done or they're in progress. They've got the water oil advisories lifted. They've got like, something like 68 percent of them. So they're actually making, and that's in six years. So they're actually doing what they said. They did the missing and murdered Indigenous women inquiry. They have the 236 recommendations that are, are moving forward and they put resources into that. They have done an incredible amount of work. I think the problem is, and I say this all the time, is uh, we don't get it into the public domain very quickly. And I know that a lot of the negotiations that are going across the are going on across the table where jurisdiction and authority is being addressed are not in the public domain until they're resolved. So you, you don't put negotiations as they're moving forward out there. So I think a lot of people don't realize that the Minister of Crown Relations has done an incredible job of actually lifting a lot of those conversations. Uh, child welfare is being addressed. You know, the standards being ad accommodated, the, the way it's funded being, being, being changed. So there's a lot going on that I guess just doesn't get really out there. And I think it's been one of my sort of over the side complaints about it all is like, you're doing all this great work. Why don't you let people know about it so that they can understand that we are actually moving forward very quickly. So all of those things, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, that got royal assent under this government. There's a lot going on, I think, that we need to be proud of. And um, reconciliation, that's my gig. I mean, I do, I'm the chair for the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation at the University of Manitoba. I'm pushing this all the time. I know what's going on. We have our thumb on the pulse whether it's about putting resources into the unmarked graves and ensuring that those communities are doing the work, not outside people. We're ensuring that the communities themselves are lifted in governance, in child welfare, and in every other place that I can actually honestly think about. So yeah, I think Justin Trudeau's done a great job of it, and I think he needs to continue to do his work, and I think we all need to be in there actually ensuring that we're sort of pushing him along and ensuring that our voices are a part of that conversation. Jason, the Liberals think they've got a good story to tell as it relates to Indigenous issues. Uh, what's the good story the NDP thinks it has to tell on this? Well, I, um, I'm an Indigenous leader and I've worked with the current government and I would, you know, beg to differ a bit, but that's not the time for I don't think right now. Uh, the focus of the NDP, and I, I know you mentioned earlier on that we were the only party to speak about genocide and, and I, I know we have a good understanding of that. But you also mentioned that we don't talk about um, sovereignty. But what we do talk about is enacting true nation-to-nation -nation relationships. And, and the approach from the NDP is not the paternalistic top-down approach that Indigenous people are so accustomed to. I, I know the system's not working. And if it, if it was working, I, I wouldn't be here. I would be at home still fulfilling my duties as chief. But it's not working for us, and, and I know that. Um, from the other end of it, not not from the top-down approach, but from from the other end of it, on the communities, 
we're not getting the response. And the BWAs, they have been lifted and then reinstated, you know, days later. So that, that's a struggle. I, I worked across the country um, uh, training people, training Indigenous people to run water and wastewater facilities. This isn't a turnkey solution, and it takes real investment. And we have to stop fighting ourselves. We have to stop fighting Indigenous children, stop spending money fighting our people. And, and I'm very happy to see these two lovely Indigenous ladies running. And I, I hope that they don't suffer the same consequences as Jody Wilson, Raybould, or, or Mumalak. That would be a terrible, terrible thing to see. We have to make sure that we have an inclusive country and an inclusive government. That's what the NDP brings, is inclusivity. Thank you. Well, Cynthia, since uh, Jason just brought it up, and, and if he didn't, I was going to, I, I can't not ask you about the fact that the first ever Indigenous Minister of Justice in Canadian history, Jody Wilson-Raybould, uh, just has a book out right now, which... Uh, you know, dropped a bit of a bomb on this election campaign, certainly in the Liberal camp, uh, essentially calling Justin Trudeau a phony and a liar. Uh, are, are, how comfortable are you running for the Liberals under these circumstances? I'm perfectly comfortable working with, with the Liberals under these circumstances. I have actually had the, the, I guess, the privilege and the pleasure of working with many of the, you know, many of the inside people for about the last decade. I've worked with, alongside Carolyn Bennett. I've worked alongside, I've actually worked alongside Minister Wilson as well when we were doing the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Free Inquiry process. I've worked with Patty Haidu. I think that these the people that are in these positions are doing the very level best that they possibly can, and uh, that would be my intention as well. And and I'm not going out to throw stones at anybody. I think uh, Jody has her own opinion on what happened and her own story that she can tell. It is not my place to actually interject anything into that story. I mean, she feels what she feels and she experienced what she experienced. But it is not stopping us from actually moving forward. And, and, and we're going to continue moving forward whether uh, the book does well or not. And I'm sure she will as well. So I always wish her the best. Uh, she's a lovely lady. And I, I think that we we can't just say, okay, this one person has had a negative experience. or And I know that the Inuit lady also had a very negative experience. Um, I've had negative experiences. So I am an Indigenous woman. I know how difficult it can be. I work in, in, in an industry. I work in education, higher education. I know that it can be challenging. But that doesn't mean that we have to, to drop everything give up. I've been working hard with people from every walk of life for the last 40 years. I'm not going to stop now. All right. Lorraine, let me put that to you. Is the Jody Wilson-Raybould story a cautionary tale of what can happen when Indigenous people try to engage in the, I'll use the expression that I often hear Indigenous people use, in the Canadian parliamentary colonial settler style system right so i've never I, I don't think that the liberal party has ever appealed to me and i i did think that the principles and values of the green party resonated with me because they're very close to the seven grandfather teachings that talk about respect for diversity wisdom courage bravery honesty uh, the, these are foundational principles of the green party and within i think within the rejuvenation of the party in the last year, I, there's been a commitment um, to look at equity and diversity in the party and make space and provide support uh, for candidates um, from, and they say equity seeking groups, but diverse candidates, lending support to them in, uh, in campaign and in their engagement in the party. In November, the Greens are going to be voting on a motion to make uh, three seats on federal council available for a First Nation, an Inuit, and a Métis person, recognizing that there's got to be space for Indigenous participation in governance of the party. Uh, that, and that's going to help us work towards, you know, achieving equity and respecting diversity. With just a couple of minutes left here, let me see if I can get one more question in under the wire. And Jason, I'll start with you. You know, uh, there were people in Quebec many years ago who, in their wisdom, decided that they weren't adequately represented on Parliament Hill, and so they set up their own party, the Bloc Québécois. It represents Quebec interests as they see them uh, in this country. They're obviously nationalists slash sovereigntists slash separatists, uh, but they have that representation. Why has, uh, let's just call it the Indigenous People's Party of Canada, never been created, in your view? It was. It never really took hold, but it was attempted. So I, I think, number one, everything has its time and place. And there was attempts to, you know, work at nation-to-nation -nation relationships, and we haven't gotten there. So I think where it leaves us is 
you know, the 77 of us that see that this is the time now to enter the system as it stands and try and make those positive changes to move towards a place where Indigenous people need it to be. I would love to have an Indigenous People's Party of Canada. I, I just don't see that as the time right now. I don't think Canada is quite ready for that. I think we're ready for change and to embrace Indigenous candidates. But I don't know that we would be able to elect a member in the ridings that we have now. We have to be more inclusive. And we didn't get into this problem by ourselves, and we won't get out by ourselves. We have to work together. Cynthia, last word to you. I note you said that it was attempted, but it really did not take off. Yeah, no, I, exactly. It, it, they did make an attempt at it, and and it's really challenging. You remember that this this country has done a huge amount of damage to the indigenous population. We still are are grappling with what we call the legacy effect. Whether it was about contact and the epidemics, or whether it was about the Indian residential school institutions, or whether it was about Indian hospitals, which also contributed, I might add, to vaccine resistance in our communities. We're not there yet either. We have a lot of work to do. I think we're doing a great job. We have some amazing young people coming up and amazing leadership, and you have one of those guys. On right here on, on the TV right now. I, I think we have a, a, bit, a ways to go, but I think we're getting educated in two ways. We have, you know, we're Western and traditional. Our, our, our ceremonies are being, everything is being reconstituted, our languages, our cultures. I think we got a, a little ways to go, but we are going to be standing very strong very shortly, and maybe it will work then, or maybe we'll create designated seats, or, or, or we don't know. But one of the things I could tell you for absolute certainty is that we are having a profound influence on this country. We always have had. The foundations are Indigenous. They're going to stay that way, and we're looking at restoring of justice and we're looking at you know new forms of governance systems we're looking we're going to be there making it happen we are happy to remind our viewers and listeners that lorraine reckmans is seeking your vote as the green party candidate in leeds grenville thousand islands and rideau lakes jason henry in lambton kent middlesex for the ndp and cynthia wesley eskimo for the liberals in simcoe north thanks to you three for joining us on tvo tonight stay safe out there on the campaign trail and good luck to you all thank you Take care. thank you steve Revelations of the unmarked remains of Indigenous children buried at former residential school sites over the past several months was stunning news from coast to coast to coast. It seemed to have hit this country in such a way that many expected it to put reconciliation and Indigenous issues front and centre. And then the election was called. With us for their impressions of those issues in the campaign, and as is our custom, we'll introduce our guests from furthest away to closest to our studio, starting in Thunder Bay, Ontario, with Willow Fiddler, reporter for the Globe and Mail. In Ottawa, Cindy Blackstock, Executive Director, First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada. And in Ontario's capital city, Pam Palmiter, Professor and Chair in Indigenous Governance at what is, at least for now, still called Ryerson University. And Riley Yesno, a PhD student at the University of Toronto, working on questions to do with the attitudes of Indigenous youth and who has plain and simply the best Twitter handle I've ever seen in my life. She is found at Riley Yes No Maybe. That is perfect, Riley. I love that. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this discussion tonight here on TVO. I want to start by just playing a clip from Steve Bonspiel. This is from uh, an episode of this program six years ago on whether Indigenous people should vote in Canadian elections. 2015. Sheldon, if you would. My argument is that, first of all, it's a foreign system, so uh, we should not be participating. But second of all, that if we merely partake in this uh, election, it uh, doesn't mean that we're going to get the results that we want. It doesn't mean that things are going to change in terms of how the government deals with us, uh, which is very paternalistic. It doesn't mean that we're going to get more land back. It doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to get our, our point across and be equal partners at the table. Cindy Blackstock, let me start with you, and I'd like to hear everybody on this. Do you think that still represents the majority of Indigenous opinion here today? It's a complicated decision to make. I mean, we are independent nations, and we want to be respectful of our own governments. Uh, but I personally choose to vote in the election because I want to influence how the government is relating to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, which has been historically very colonial and still is. Pam Palmer, how about you? 
I think a significant number of people feel that way, that, you know, why vote for your next oppressor, your next colonizer? And then there's other people who would normally not vote because of that idea, but they want to vote as a form of harm reduction. So not so much, hey, I support this party, but oh my goodness, let's make sure we don't get that party in. And then there's a large number of people who, equally valid, want to vote and want to participate and try to influence the outcome of the election for good purposes or to keep bad people out. Are you going to vote? No. Do you ever vote? No. Gotcha. Riley, how about to you? <laughs> Are you, are, what, what do you what do you think about this this view that these are elections put on by our colonial oppressors and therefore we ought not to participate? I, I think that that's a really valid take for a lot of Indigenous people. I mean, I think that the clip you just showed from 2015 still resonates for many folks, and I sat here, you know, nodding my head because. The fact is, is that Canada, you know, can't exist without the continued dispossession of Indigenous people, of taking our lands, our resources, um, and using those to profit. And so for a lot of people, it feels like, why would I vote for any oppressor? And for Indigenous people whose key concerns are some of the things that Steve mentioned in that clip, you know, things like sovereignty, things like land back. Uh, no, no Canadian party, I, I think at this point at least, has ever um, presented an option that says that they will secure those things for us. Um, and so it also feels like you're not really voting for something that's going to bring meaningful change. But I also agree with what Pam was saying about how we can see the vote as an act of harm reduction as well. And, and that's sometimes what I bring in my mindset to the ballot. Um, and I have voted um, in every election I've been able to for those reasons. You have voted and you will vote this time as well. Yes, I already did. Advanced polling. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Uh, Willow, you're the last one. What do you say on this? Um, I agree. It's, it's a complicated question, um, you know, whether or not Indigenous people participate in the in the election process. Um, and then I'll just point out again Merrick McLeod's question at the leaders' debate last mm -hmm. week. Uh, another important question that, that Indigenous voters ask is, why should we trust um, uh, the, any government uh, who makes promises after 150 years of, of, um, of oppression, basically, and, and colonial uh, systems that, that uh, we've lived under? Do you vote in this election, Willow? I will vote. I haven't yet. I will, though. And have you voted in the past? I have, yes. I have, and then I, both. Um, I've been both a voter and a non-voter. I wonder if, hmm, what should we do here? Cindy, would you <laughs> attempt to try to convince Pamela why she ought to vote, even though she never does? <laughs> No, I wouldn't, because I think her, her choice is legitimate. Um, what we're doing is we are, all of us on this panel, really pressing for the proper changes. A vote is just one way of doing that. Pam spends her entire life pushing for that change, and that actually is far more important. We need to, as a collective, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, push every single day for the types of solutions that are already on the books, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action, the murder of missing Indigenous women and girls calls for justice, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples' recommendations. There's so many solutions, and all of us need to be pushing, but not just us, the non-Indigenous population. They need to be pushing and holding their own elected leaders accountable for the lack of action. They choose to perpetrate this, these injustices in government. It isn't a failure. It isn't a mistake. It's a choice by this government and others before it to perpetrate these harms. All right. Conversely, Pamela, would you care to try to convince the other three why it's a waste of their time to vote and they should do like you and not vote? <laughs> no, never. And there's lots of reasons why. Because under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, not only do we have the right to be self-governing, sovereign and autonomous over our own territories and governments, we also have the right, as people who have been colonized, you know, occupied territories, to participate in the colonizing government as we choose. We have that right and it's and it's an important right. And so I think, you know, voting is part of it. But you know, I agree with Cindy. I think if the only thing Canadians ever did was vote, we'd be in a lot of trouble. We need to mm -hmm. encourage Canadians not just to use their numbers to vote, but to also take action and push and hold governments to account. That's where the real change comes in. Voting is like the least a citizen could do. Understood. All right, I'm going to move on here. And Willow, why don't I start with you on this one? Uh, we well remember how shocked non-Indigenous Canadians were, I think it's 
fair to put it that way, with the discovery of the grave sites unmarked near residential schools. It really shook the country. And then the election got called. And I'd like your sense about how significant those discoveries have been throughout the course of this election campaign. Well, it's a question I'm hearing is, is why, why aren't these issues kind of front and center um, during this campaign? Um, and, you know, I think the fear, um, the concern um, of having such a, a quick election under these circumstances of a global pandemic, I mean, the third election in six years, um, I think really puts a lot of pressure on Indigenous voters um, when it comes to these uh, issues that we're seeing, like the, the burials and all of that. I mean, um, the, I think, generally speaking, the, there's a concern and fear that uh, Indigenous issues are going to be pushed back further anyway, and, and there's the risk of that in an election. And under these circumstances, I think that's that's even more so. Um, but but these aren't. I mean, the burials. Uh, I just need to point out. I mean, that these this hasn't been forgotten by Indigenous people, by survivors and their families and their communities. Um, and and it's been an opportunity for the political parties to to kind of really take hold of that. And um, I don't think we've been seeing a lot of that this time around. Well, that's what I want to find out, Riley. The opportunity has been there for this to be a much more prominent issue during the campaign than it perhaps has been. Do you think it, the opportunity has been seized by the main mainline political parties? I mean, I, I certainly think the the opportunity has been seized, but I also think it's, it's kind of gross, right, that we're framing it as this now in an election time. I feel to two conflicting sort of things about this, and one is that you know it hasn't been talked about enough. That Indigenous issues generally have not been talked about enough in the election campaigns, um, and then we see parties like, say, the Conservative Party who commit to only the TRC commitments that uh, deal with unmarked graves and burials, and it effectively becomes a way for them to, you know, scapegoat um, their lack of commitment by dealing with this thing that they think is the trendy, only thing people are talking about at the time, and not actually deal with many of the other meaningful things that Indigenous people have been calling for for decades and centuries. Um, and so uh, it's it's, uh, it's an interesting to see how it's playing out, and I think it's very telling the way Canadians only a couple months ago, right, were wearing their orange shirts and flying their flags past mass, and now so many people are lining up to vote for political leaders who, um, you know, will talk about the benefits of residential schools um, or who in the last few years have promised the world to Indigenous people and delivered next to nothing. Um, it's, it's really telling from an outside perspective to watch the Canadian electorate. Pamela, how about to you? The momentum that we saw on these issues earlier before the election was called, do you still see it happening now? Well, here's what I see. The, the momentum that we had of being in the media almost died overnight when the election was called. But the momentum within Indigenous communities and the Canadian population hasn't stopped. But there's a disconnect because you don't see that momentum continuing on with the federal party leaders, either in the debates, their platforms, or what they're advocating. So there's a real disconnect. And think about the single most prominent issue in the media over the last two years, aside from the pandemic, has been Indigenous issues. You know, Cindy, Cindy's court case, the federal government continues to litigate against First Nations kids in foster care, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans trying to stop Mi'kmaq people from fishing, even now still, 1492 Land Back Lane, that went on for well over a year, Wet'suwet'en strong protests, murdered of missing Indigenous women and girls, I mean, dominated the media. This should have been the single most important issue addressed by these federal party leaders uh, because Canadians, as we know from the recent surveys, said their number one issue was Indigenous issues, that reconciliation was going to be a priority in how they vote. How could the federal party leaders not be so connected to what Canadian citizens themselves are saying? Well, Cindy Blackstock, I know you love to collect old reports. Do you have anything that might help us understand our current circumstances any better? 
Yeah, one of the things that I'd like to say is that when we have 5,000 children in unmarked graves now. That is 15 children for every member of parliament who will be running for election. Think about that. And the survivors left the work plan for the country and the TRC's calls to action. But there has been tons of reports. This one is from 1967. Uh, I would have been three years old. And it was talking about the need for equity and culturally based, quote, Indian education back then. And it has a section on public opinion that I think is really relevant. It says the proposals made in this study are not likely to be adopted on the scale or with the speed required unless public opinion changes too. And an alert and informed public will bring about the changes that are needed. Public indifference will result in sluggish political action, low budgets, and poorly conceived projects with low priorities. Uh, that's exactly what's happening. And what we need to embrace as, as people is that the government serves us. What they often want to do is just get our vote and then leave, let them leave alone for four years. Well, that, that can't happen on this because Canada is a repeat offender when it comes to First Nations, Métis and Inuit children. First through residential schools, the 60s group, and now in violation of 20, 20 legal orders to stop discriminating against First Nations children in foster care and uh, to ensure that First Nations children get adequate public services. So this is not a time to turn away. Way. We need to really take hold of our power as individuals to press for change and tell the federal government, whoever is in power, you are only going to get in power if you're really committed to do this. And if you don't follow through, we're going to take you out. Hmm. Riley, I want to start this next round with you. And that is there are apparently 77 Indigenous candidates running in this election. And that's an all time high. And it's up from 61 in 2019. So that's up a lot. What do you infer from that? Um, I think that shows just how, you know, how active Indigenous people are. The fact that we're having this conversation about to vote, not to vote, the benefits and why that's all part of, you know, our collective struggle towards liberation for Indigenous people. To see so many Indigenous candidates running uh, means that, you know, there are many people pursuing different theories of change within our communities. Um, ultimately, I, I think in many cases for the betterment of us all, right? And so I think that that also shows that um, as much as we're saying, you know, voting is whatever, um, that there are people out there who also see this as, you know, a way to get voice into Parliament. And, and I often think, uh, when I think about Indigenous representation in politics, right, um, that where I see the most benefit that it can have is to be able to act as another uh, layer of harm reduction in Parliament. Do I think that Canada or any Canadian ele elected officials, Indigenous or not, are ever going to, again, bring sovereignty, land back, all those things? Probably not. But do I think that they can vote against some really harmful and regressive bills? Absolutely. Um, and so I can respect that theory of change for many people. All right. Let me put that to Pamela. Pamela, you, you've told us already you don't vote. You've never voted. And yet here are Indigenous people who are actually running to serve in the Parliament of Canada. And some of them, no doubt, will win. Uh, what's your take yeah. on that? I think that's great. All the different ways in which Native people are actively working to pursue change in the way that they feel they can, using the opportunities they can, I think that's fantastic. I think we just have to be careful about what we expect from that. So can we expect that that, you know, sole Indigenous MP is going to be able to counter bad things in their party? No, they have to toe the party line. So while they are Indigenous candidates, we just have to remember that they're members of parties, they must toe the party line, uh, and, and, that, and that's important to remember. And it's also important to remember, we have some real heroes. Former NDP MP Romeo Saganash was been so effective at speaking out, at lobbying, and he was part of the many Indigenous people who tried to bring forward the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I mean, there's a force behind Indigenous peoples who are there with their, you know, traditional cultural values and are always working forward to change. So I embrace all our warriors out there trying to advocate in the best way they can. Yeah, Willow, I note that in the Ontario legislature, when Saul Mamakwa gets up to ask a question, Question. He gets something that no other MPP in that chamber gets, and that is he gets silence. People listen.
they show him a level of respect that they don't show any of the other MPPs. So what's your view on whether a single indigenous MP in this case can make a difference? Yeah, Saul's been a really interesting case. You know, he's kind of um, has a reputation here in the north. He's uh, very community grounded, grounded in his his own community and the communities and in here he's um, established a, a, a relationship uh, beforehand. Um, and I think it's part of, you know, we, we're seeing that, we're kind of seeing that strategy playing out in the in the NDP this time around. Well, I mean, actually the couple of times anyways, and when it comes to the Indigenous vote, um, using Indigenous candidates um, to to garner those, those votes um, is a strategy that could be effective. And I think that's kind of what the NDP is hoping for. Um, you know, there, there's, there's right significant ridings with high high First Nations voters um, and and those could you know have the potential to to determine outcomes um, in those ridings one of those is here in northwestern Ontario in Kenora um, where we where, where there's an indigenous candidate for the NDP and um, not only that but Tanya Cameron who's uh, organizing behind the scenes there really you know is is connected established um, you know knows how to do the work and if there's any any chance that that um, uh, an indigenous candidate will will win? It's because of that work behind the scenes, and I think on the ground that that makes it happen. Riley, let me follow up on that with you because in 2015 and in 2019, there was I think a significant push by many in the indigenous community to get people, in particular young indigenous people, out to vote. Is that push still happening this time round? Yeah, I, I think it is. I I will say I don't know. To what success? I think that um, Indigenous youth, obviously, there's a, there's a real vested interest for political parties in this country to campaign to Indigenous youth as poorly as they do it. So we're the fastest growing population in this country for long-term party building. This is a demographic that they would absolutely need to be able to convince that they are the best leaders in the best party. But I think young people, you know, they are always on the front lines. Indigenous young people are always on the front lines of our resistance movements. They have grown up seeing the violence that Canada has enacted on our people, and I think are some of the most radical community members that we have from coast to coast to coast. And so I think that um, perhaps more so than in my grandparents' generation, in my grandparents' circles, my colleagues um, have really intense conversations about whether or not voting is worth it, whether or not we want to be part of this system at all. And more and more people, I think, identifying with their nations rather than with Canadians, which, you know, has effects come election time. In which case, Cindy, maybe you could give some advice to the non-Indigenous people who are watching this right now and who, when they go to the ballot box, those who haven't voted in the advance polls, when they do that on September 20th, what you would like to have them think as they get set to mark their X somewhere on the ballot. It's not only uh, asking them key questions about what they're going to do specifically to implement the TRC calls to action, the murder of missing Indigenous women and girls calls for justice, and to stop litigating against survivors and First Nations kids in court. It's a question of character. There are kind of two kinds of leaders. There's people who want to be someone, and then there's people who want to do something, that have the moral courage to stand up against their party when necessary, to put the people first. That's the kind of leader that I want to vote for. I don't want someone like I have currently in my riding who won't even respond to constituents' emails when they uh, disagree with her platform. That's not the type of leadership that we should be voting for under any circumstances. So that question of moral courage is important. And I think Jody Wilson-Raybould, uh, Jane Philpott show that even when you are morally courageous and you stand up for good governance, that that means that you might be tossed out. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. You have to act with integrity and you have to take on those difficult issues if we're not going to have kind of a government that is just democracy in name only. You're going to forgive this follow-up question, but it seems pretty obvious. Do you want to tell us who you're voting for or who you think other people should vote for? Well, I can't tell you who I'm voting for. I actually already voted. But I voted for the party that had the most uh, in terms of the campaign on First Nations, Métis and Inuit people and also on the, on the environment, which I also care a lot about. Um, and I also voted for the leader that I felt had the most integrity. 
And um, I'm hoping other people will do that too. Uh, I'm not going to leave it to myself to infer what that meant. So do you want to fill in the blanks? Uh, no, I think people can go and look at those platforms. Um, I try to be um, a nonpartisan. I think people have to vote with their hearts, not vote because Cindy Blackstock is voting in a certain way. I think that when we demand change, we have to push for it. Um, and so, I, I, and I do that not only on voting day, but of course um, in courtrooms and in public uh, across the other 365 days a year. Indeed you do. Uh, all right, Pamela, do you want to offer our viewers and listeners any advice on who you think's got the best platform out there as it relates to Indigenous people? Uh, let's say it's not the Conservatives. It's not the People's Party of Canada. So, you know, you can look at the other platforms, but we have to be careful. What I would want people to do is not necessarily look at individual candidates because literally your best friend could be running in the election. Your mom could be running in the election. But what does the platform stand for? And does it stand for human rights? Does it stand for Indigenous reconciliation, climate change, social equality, ending systemic racism. If you can answer yes to all of that, then you've got a several platforms to choose from. However, if you've got a platform like the Conservatives that is attacking human rights and want to reinstate, you know, get rid of the gun ban and, you know, roll back women's rights on abortion. I mean, these are very regressive policies. So I wouldn't tell them which one to vote for, but I'd say definitely not the Conservatives or the People's Party. Even though there are Indigenous people who are running for the Conservative Party? Alleged Indigenous people. So of the 77, it's important to remember, some of them are only declaring or identifying as Indigenous during this election. So we, we have to assume, if these are the 77 self-identified people, we don't know that they're actually Indigenous. That's another thing to be careful for. Okay, Riley, how about to you? Any, any advice for those watching or listening? Yeah, I mean, I will say having, having analyzed all the platforms, I would say that I think, you know, just reading from the top that the NDP have the strongest platform when it comes to Indigenous issues. But I say this with, you know, the caveat, and it's, it's a big one, right? With when we think back to, say, 2015 uh, election, Justin Trudeau also had, you know, at that time, the best platform I had seen for Indigenous people ever. He made so many pretty promises. And here we are six years later um, with so little to show for it. So, you know, also, also that platform doesn't necessarily mean anything uh, when we see what, what uh, impact we want. What actually matters is what meaningful day-to-day -day changes Indigenous people see and feel on the ground. And that's something that's going to take a lot more than just a vote to get. Uh, but I will echo that probably not the Conservative Party, the Liberal Party, who I've seen throughout this campaign, actively try and rewrite uh, the relationship with Indigenous people. You know, if you watch the debate, you saw Justin Trudeau just straight up lie about taking Indigenous kids to court. Uh, you saw Aaron O'Toole say that Canada has always been a country that stood against a apartheid as if the Indian Act is not on the books right now. Um, and so that off the hop, you know, shows that those are parties that are so out of touch with the reality of this country and of Indigenous people and are not somebody that I would say could get my vote. Well, and Steve, if I can just say, yeah. one of the things that I think we need to really watch out for is when they, when any party says, oh, the reason we haven't made any progress is because we're talking to First Nations, Métis or Inuit people. That's ridiculous. We have been calling for change for decades and hundreds of years. It is uh, inappropriate to voice responsibility for government's lack of action and accountability onto First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. That's disgusting to me. <laughs> Riley, you did something there. What was that? <laughs> oh, snap. Like, like when you see a good slam poem or something. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Uh, Willow, I got a feeling, given that you're with the Globe and Mail and you're a journalist covering this stuff, that I shouldn't ask you who you <laughs> think people should vote for. So I'll give you a pass on that one. But maybe I can turn it to this in our remaining moments here. If the, as you call it, the colonial parliamentary system has been unable to deliver justice to Indigenous people for more than a century and a half in this country, what is the next option Indigenous people are thinking about? Uh, good question. You know, I think there's there's so much work being done by by First Nations and Indigenous communities. You know, nonpartisan work that really addresses um, 
addresses a lot of these issues when it comes to, you know, clean drinking water. We think in the Scandiga, for example, and, and their ongoing troubles of, of getting their boil water advisory lifted. Um, and, 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 you know, this, this and, and the one thing I'm hearing is, um, you know, enough of this kind of Ottawa, uh, Ottawa knows best approach, um, Ottawa, you know, top down. It, it doesn't work like that. It has to start from the community. It starts from there. And, and um I, I'll just echo in what others have said in that, you know, that they 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 have the solutions um, and and they just need to be to be listened to. I mean, we got reports, reports of reports uh, and that outline all of this work. Um, you know, we don't need another political party to come in and, and, and start fresh. Um, that's not what Indigenous and First Nations communities and people need. Um, you know, they, a lot of these issues, they don't see them as partisan issues, and they're not. When it comes to clean drinking water, that's not a reconciliation issue. That's a human rights issue. We know that, and we have to act on that. And, um, and, and you know... <laughs> I, I don't I, I don't have anything optimistic to say in terms of how that that work is is going to get done um, at this point in the right. election. Let me give the last minute then to Pamela on that question. If the parliamentary system of this country hasn't delivered justice for indigenous people, what next? Well, I think it brings the country system into disrepute. We already know that policing uh, on a wide scale has already been brought into disrepute. Canadians are well aware of systemic racism, brutality, and corruption. And it'll be the same thing with this government. So oftentimes people fear, oh, what will Indigenous peoples do? I think they need to be thinking about what will Canadians do? What will Canadians think? How will they react? What is going to be the path forward with Canadians if Canadians no longer see themselves as part of a legitimate government. You can't say you're a world champion defender of human rights and then continue to commit atrocious human rights abuses and not even address the ongoing genocide. So I think we really need to be saying, um, what's this going to mean for Canada moving forward if they start thinking they don't have a legitimate government? As you four always do when you appear on this program, you give us so much to think about. So thank you for coming here tonight. Willow Fiddler, Cindy Blackstock, Pam Palmiter, Riley Yesno. Be well, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, September 15th, 2021. Tomorrow, what the parties have to say about confronting climate change. And NDP leader Jagmeet Singh joins us with his pitch to Ontario voters. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. And we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.